So I come from a long line of da Vinci's. You may know our most famous cousin, Leonardo. Inventor, engineer, anatomist, and artist. Now I'm not really a da Vinci, nor are my folks. But we do follow in his very brilliant shoes. Both of my parents were classical musicians with day jobs in medicine and in, in uh, computers. And my siblings are a photographer, printer, biologist, and a carpenter thespian, respectively. So when I showed an interest, you no, know, an obsession with drawing and painting when I was a kid, I knew it's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Now my parents were reasonable parents and they really wanted me to concentrate on studying, of course, but all I really wanted to do was draw cats, <laughs> horses, and most especially the beautiful people and their dreamy eyes in the Team Beat magazines, right? So why did I want to do this? Why, what, why was the eye so important to me even as a kid? Well, I was a really awkward kid. I was bullied a lot, and I had a really hard time connecting with my peers. You know, even as teenage humans, I think we have a desire to be understood and to connect with other people. So when I came out as an artistic person, I thought, oh, I'd found my language. You know, I had my anchor, even if my social problems persisted. You know, the old adage that, Window, the eyes are the window to the soul, well, I thought that maybe if I drew them, I might understand my peers more. But what I realized is that not only, this extended far beyond the eye, if I wanted to understand anything, the best thing for me to do was to draw it. So, much like Maximilian, who's 16 now, who you just met, when I was 16, <laughs> I found myself in my first anatomy class. I was dissecting sharks and mud puppies and turtles and creating a lot of lab reports. And what I realized is that I could use my love for drawing to understand what I was learning, so I became, began illustrating my lab reports. I actually found this, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> 1991. Uh, and my teacher noticed, <laughs> much like Maximilian's teacher, and she said, you know what? You know all those drawings and images in your textbooks? People do that for a job. <laughs> That's a job. And I thought, what? That's a job that like real people do? You know, they take, they take their artistic skill and their love for the natural environment and they combine them. It's just like me and my love for the eye. So that was it. And I set my sights on a career illustrating science. And in 10 years, I did it. I made my way through art and graduate school and became a bona fide illustrator of science. So now, when I draw the eye, not only do I appreciate it artistically, but also from a scientific perspective. And what could be more perfect for, than something like that for me? Well, a PhD, of course. <laughs> so in 2012, I successfully defended my dissertation at Wayne State in the eye, and I actualized the words of my um, anatomy teacher from high school. These are just three of the textbooks that contain my drawings. It's my real job. So I'm taking all of this understanding of anatomy and science, and I'm now applying it to my fine art, where I'm still drawing the eye. <laughs> but now, you know, I know what just beyond your vantage point makes the eyelids look the way they do, what, how the eyelashes grow and, you know, contribute to the immune system, how the tears are made, and how I might paint that to make the eye look really wet and reflective. It's all form follows function, right? It is, but there's a paradox there, and the paradox is this. I'm constantly balancing between what I know scientifically and what I'm seeing with my artist's brain. Because so I'm taught as an artist to trust what I see. So if I want to draw something like this, which I did two days ago, I need to start here. Now, as an anatomist, this is a really weird use of color on the right. And the detail is super loose. So, you know, at this stage of a drawing, I'm constantly fighting my, with myself and my really, um, my need for detail gets really twitchy. 
but I have to have faith that it'll work out in the end. The other thing I have to keep in mind is that I can't take my very, very familiar subject for granted. You know, my scientist self will pop in and say, you know, in, when you go through embryology, even the tiniest changes can create gigantic differences in the adult. And we see a tremendous diversity in the eye, even in the eyes of the same individual. So people will often, people always often think that art and science are very different. And I'm here to say that they're actually pretty sim really similar in my mind. So they both require a lot of expertise and precision and even creativity and a lot of trial and error. So as a scientist, I might do an experiment and the results might be not what I expect. It might be really challenging. And as an artist, I can be faced with similar challenges. So this piece is four by eight feet. Everything I'd done up to this point, I could pretty much fit in my pocket. So how would I even begin to draw this, right? That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is how do I buy a frame for this? I can't go to Michael's and buy a frame. So all of the stuff that you see there in the framing of this piece was from Lowe's. So challenges and solutions, creativity. Oh, I forgot that part. That's my hand and the drawing. So, Another, the most important thing to me that blends art, and, that art makes art and science similar is that they both can elicit a tremendous sense of awe and wonder in the viewer. Sure, it's because of the great diversity and beauty we see in front of us, but also it's because we know that we have so much left to learn. You know, um, when we look at this, we know that science and art are constantly changing. And as it changes, the way we draw the eye will also evolve. Much as when I was a kid, my total goal in drawing was just to make the drawings look like the person that I was drawing. To today, we're sure, I'm in, you know, looking like someone is very important. The, draw, the drawing in the upper left is my husband, for example. <laughs> but I'm also trying to convey a sense of emotion and I'm really trying to connect with my viewer. And in order to do this, I have to put a lot of trust in you and have a lot of faith. So that might mean that I don't draw every single hair that's coming out of the skin or every single pore or every single wrinkle. You know, I should leave things out because I know you as the viewer are smart. You know what the eye looks like. So what I leave out, you can fill in. And I know as a scientist that your brain actually wants to do that work. So when we establish this trust, it creates a connection between me, myself, and you. The ultimate goal with all of my work, whether it's my illustration work or my fine art, is to create this connection. And the connection built on trust is the strongest one. And what I believe is that once we establish this connection, we can look around ourselves and see the greater diversity that's amongst us. It may make us appreciate our surroundings even more. And, and recognize the humanity in each other. Because when we recognize that humanity, then we can grant people personhood and dignity. And that is something that my awkward teenage self will continue to fight for. Thank you. <laughs>